Alrighty there folks, and welcome to the Chronicle Podcast channel. This is episode 34, the establishment of Dongwu, and in case you're wondering which period we're in, we're in the Three Kingdoms period still, and we are slowly making our way through that. Now I must say, I have to say I'm sorry for the delay in releasing today's episode, and the reason why I was delayed was because there was a massive thunderstorm here last night and uh, the microphone was picking up all of the thunder and yeah, it just wouldn't have sounded good and I didn't want to produce an episode where the sound quality wasn't that great. I've had too much experience with it. I finally got myself into a place where I can actually produce a decent episode without worrying about background noises and then when a thunderstorm comes along, I'm just, no, I'm not going to do it. But in saying that, I did release an episode yesterday, but the episode is not mine. It is a part of the History Rage podcast, and it is made by Paul Bavel and Kyle Glover. And what they do is they get historians or other podcasters like myself on their show, and they basically have a rage about something in history that is misconceived. So, for example, yesterday, the episode that I released, it was all to do with the movie Braveheart and why it's so inaccurate historically. And, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I actually enjoyed it, like, because I've not looked at anything William Wallace-related in a very long time. So, to go and, like, look it all up again and find all the facts that I needed to debunk the movie, um, it was a lot of fun. So... I highly recommend you check them out, and I will leave um, a link to their podcast in the in the description for this one. So by all means, check them out. Uh, the episodes that I've listened to so far have been really good, and yeah, so shout out to Paul and Kyle there. But for now, let's get on with the main topic of today, which is Dongwu. So. Now that we're not looking at any festivals, we can now focus on the Three Kingdoms period. And here, we're looking at the same time period, but we're going to take our attention away from the north, where Tal Tal was kicking ass and abducting emperors. And instead, we're going to look to the southeast of China, where the second of the Three Kingdoms established their power. So keep this in mind. We are looking at the same time period, but we are looking at a different area. There will be three people who we will focus on the most in this episode, and they are all of the same family, so that should make people's lives easier in terms of the names. So, the three men we will be looking at are Sun Jian and his sons, Sun Tu and Sun Quan. Sun Jian is the general who really set up the foundation for Sun Tu to then go conquering the Southlands, or Dongwu, as they were called during this time, but it was Sun Tzu's brother, Sun Quan, who would become the first emperor of Wu. Now I know you must be thinking, but Dean, you've spoken about a state of Wu before. And now to the think of it, a state of Wu as well. And yes, you would be correct. I have mentioned these names before. There were both a state of Wu and a state of Wei during the spring and autumn or Warren States period. So are they connected? And the answer in short is no, they aren't connected, but they are in a way. So the general idea of the origins of a family are kind of related. So basically what will happen is, according to Enclaved Microstate on Reddit, by the way, and he is correct, um, and I'm just quoting him here, as a rule of thumb, dynasties up to the Mongol Yuan opted for names that reflected their geographical origin or where the continuation of an existing personal title, while those from the Mongols onward chose names that had some sort of meaning. Going through the major dynasties, the Qin was a continuation of the existing kingdom of Qin. The Han was so named because its founder, Liu Bang, was given the fiefdom of Hangzhong, located on the Han River, after the fall of the Qin. The Jin got its name from the Sima clan's control of the Jin River in Shaanxi, and the Northern Wei, or Tao Wei, got their parts located in the general region of the Wei Kingdoms, and there was one during the Warren States, and another one for the Three Kingdoms. That was the end of the quote there. 
As for Dongwu, it is similar to the northern way established by Tao Tao. There was a state of Wu who were around during the spring and autumn period, and it was because someone was given the title of Duke of Wu. Then almost a thousand years later, you have Dongwu, officially established by Sun Quan in the year 229. So I hope that brief overview of how Chinese dynasties get their names gives you a little more insight, but I thought I'd better mention it now before moving forward. And just to note, Enclaved Microstate does mention the rest of China's dynasties and why they were named, but I left them out as I haven't gotten there in my podcast just yet. Hopefully we will get there within the next two years or so, but we shall see. So Sun Jian was born in the year 155 AD in the Jiandong region. For those of you who do not know where that is, think of modern day Zhejiang province. The name of the commander he was born in was... Wu Commander. So you can see the connection for the name of the state now. Sun Jian grew up at a time when the eunuchs were manipulating emperors in court, and then of course there was the Yellow Turban Rebellion in 184, and this is where Sun Jian really did establish himself as a capable general. He helped crush the rebels, and it was at this time he entered the service of a powerful noble by the name of Yuan Shu. Yuan Shu has been touched upon in previous episodes here, but to sum him up, he was the half-brother of Yuan Shao, and and the Yuan clan had come from a pretty decent position within the imperial court. The Yuan brothers, however, were stuck in a bitter rivalry, which which would pretty much lead to the death of both of them. And the reason why there was a rivalry between the two brothers was because Yuan Shao was the oldest, but he was not born legitimately. Whereas Yuan Shu was the, the son of both their father and Yuan, and the Yuan, the Daddy Yuan, <laughs> we'll just call him Daddy Yuan, his wife. So, you know, Yuan Shu claimed he was the legitimate heir, whereas Yuan Shao claimed he was the eldest, therefore he was. So, yeah, take that as you will. Anyway, on paper at least, Yuan Shu seemed like a fair and reliable man. He wasn't. By the time Dong Zhuo had seized power, Yuan Shu participated in the coalition which was formed against him, the Guangdong Coalition that is. From what I read, it was Sun Jian who was, without a doubt, the most active member within the coalition. He led his small unit within Yuan Shu's army and fought the enemy bravely at the Battle of Hulao Pass in 190 AD. Despite being defeated in this battle, however, upon entering the ruined city of Luoyang, it is said that a subordinate of Sun Jian's looked for water inside the well and found the Imperial Jade Seal, or in Chinese, the Chuanggua Yu Si. The very seal that Qin Shi Huang himself made. Well, not Qin Shi Huang, but his Prime Minister, Li Si. And on the seal itself, it says, Shou Min Yu Tian, Qi Shou Yong Chang. Now in English, what this means is, being granted the mandate by heaven. Thus we hope the citizens live long and the country remains prosperous. Yeah, the Chinese version sounds better, I know. But why is this significant? The reason why is because after the Qin dynasty fell and when Liu Bang established the Han dynasty, this seal was still used by emperors and only emperors could use it. Even the text on the seal gives that mandate of heaven feel to it. And it's a good way to legitimize yourself if you want to usurp a current dynasty. So of course, what happened here was that when Dong Zhuo burned Luoyang to the ground, the Jade Seal was lost until this soldier under the command of Sun Jian found it, and now Sun Jian had the Imperial Seal. Despite having the seal though, Sun Jian was no dummy. He didn't just suddenly declare himself a new emperor. That would have been extremely foolish considering where he was. You know, there's a bunch of powerful warlords around him, and he's not the most powerful. Uh, So anyway, what Sun Jian decided to do was just keep the seal in secret until he had built up his own power. 
Now there are two stories as to what happened next. The first is pretty simple. The secret was kept and the seal doesn't appear again until later on in our narrative. The second, however, was that word leaked out that Sun Jian had the Imperial Seal, and Yuan Shao, in particular, was particularly peeved off by this, and secretly plotted the way to kill Sun Jian as he travelled back after the coalition fell apart. Now, speaking of the coalition, when Dong Zhuo was killed by Lu Bu in the year 192, the coalition, and indeed the Han Empire, began to tear itself to pieces. The Yuan brothers, in particular, were both in decent positions of power. Yuan Shu was in the south, just north of the Yangtze River, whereas Yuan Shao had established himself in Hubei, which is north of the Yellow River. The two brothers began to play other warlords in their games for power and wanted to be the big boy on the block. So naturally, the two had begun to form alliances. Yuan Shao had alliances with Liu Biao in Jin province and Cao Cao in Yan province, whereas Yuan Shu managed to make an alliance with Gong Sun Zan, who was up further north of Yuan Shao. Despite a lack of allies though, Yuan Shu was the most powerful warlord in the south of China at this moment in time. And again, there are two stories as to what happened next. The first story is that when um, Yuan Shu was trying to set himself up as a powerful warlord, he sent Sun Jian to battle with Liu Biao. Now, Sun Jian, as it might be, he was a victim of his own success, and he travelled far too deep into Jin province. And there he was ambushed, and then he was killed by an arrow under the command of a general named Huang Zhu. Now the second is that while Sun Jian was travelling home from battling out with Dong Zhuo, he was stopped by the governor of Jin province, Liu Biao. Now Liu Biao was under the orders of Yuan Shao to actually kill Sun Jian. But Liu Biao actually told Sun Jian this and said, oh by the way, I've been ordered to kill you and I'm not going to get involved with this, so just go on your way and I'll see you later. So Sun Jian was very thankful and he started walking on his way. Little did he know that as soon as Liu Biao was out of sight, a general under the command of Liu Biao, again a man named Huang Zhu, appeared from the top of a mountain pass and ambushed Sun Jian's men. Sun Jian was subsequently shot by an arrow released from Huang Zhu and killed in the ambush. Luckily for the Sun family though, Sun Tzu and Sun Quan, who were apparently present, escaped the ambush. Regardless of how he died, by 191 AD, Sun Jian was dead, and all of his belongings were left to his eldest son, Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu at this time was still really young. Born in the year 175, Sun Tzu was only 16 when his father died. Now it's important to note here that when Sun Jian was killed, Yuan Shu's fortunes were rapidly declining, as he was invaded in the north by Cao Cao and was soundly beaten. Despite this though, Yuan Shu still had a group of retainers and he managed to create a new power base of operations at Shouchun. Following in his father's footsteps, Sun Tzu offered his services to Yuan Shu, a young prospect and almost as good, if not better, than his father. Sun Tzu began to prove himself from his early age, and what helped him was Yuan Shu's, at first, generous treatment of the young prospect. All of his father's earlier subordinates were now under the command of Sun Tzu, and he now had a following of his own within the court of Yuan Shu. Allegedly, some people say that the reason why Yuan Shu was so generous to Sun Tzu was because he gave Yuan Shu the Imperial Jade Seal in exchange for his father's retainers. Sun Tzu, with his father's followers, and with his best friend Zhou Yu, 
distinguished himself as a capable leader. I haven't mentioned Zhou Yu yet, but both Sun Tzu and Zhou Yu met in er at an early age and had become sworn brothers. Sun Tzu was more the brawn, and Zhou Yu was more the brains. Sun Tzu's first real test had arrived when he was 17. A man by the name of Lu Kang had betrayed Yuan Shu and had taken some of Yuan Shu's most southerly commanderies for himself. Sun Tzu was granted the title, Colonel Who Cherishes Righteousness, and sent south to deal with this traitor. The battle for the province was over extremely quickly. Sun Tzu had completely swept the floor with Lu Kang and defeated him with ease. As a reward, Sun Tzu expected to be the new administrator of the commandery, as Yuan Shu actually promised him this. But instead, it was given to a, na a man named Liu Xun, a personal friend of Yuan Shu. So Sun Tzu, as you one may imagine, was extremely pissed off by this insult. But nevertheless, Yuan Shu kept him busy and sent him on another campaign against a warlord named Liu Yao, who'd established himself south of the Yangtze River and now he was encroaching on Yuan Shu's territory. Now, we can't be having that, can we? In a blitzkrieg style manoeuvre, Sun Tzu led 5,000 cavalry across the river in a lightning campaign and took Liu Yao and his generals completely by surprise and won the first few engagements against the warlord, who had more men than he did. Despite this though, the war began to gradually grind to a stalemate. To get past this though, Sun Tzu performed a feint Pretending to attack Liu Yao's generals head on, he then suddenly marched north, looking like he was going to retreat. But then, all of a sudden, he attacked Moling, which is modern day Nanjing, and Chua, modern day Chuanzhou. From here, Sun Tzu had created his own little power base for himself and was proven to be a distinguished figure within the region. Having received a bloody nose, Liu Yan ordered his generals to retreat which gave Sun Tzu time to consolidate his rule in Wu Commander. Now, just think of where modern day Shanghai is. That is the area that we are talking about. Now, of course, during this time of, like, a time of war, some groups or bandits or factions try to take advantage of the war and establish their own power bases. And in particular, they do this on the mountains. The two po most prominent men were Yan Bai Hu, also known as White Tiger Yan, and Tai Shi, oh, sorry, Tai Shi Tzu. Now the two of them were capable commanders, and Tai Shi Tzu in particular was a formidable opponent. So much so that whenever Sun Tzu himself dueled him, the two were always evenly matched. Yeah, I got that from the Romance of Three Kingdoms novel, but I'm plugging it in here because I hope it's true. But what is true is that Sun Tzu was victorious, and rather than killing captives, he cleverly told all captives that they had two options. They could fight for his victorious army, or they could go back to their hometowns and farm. Touched by this mercy, the majority of the men joined Sun Tzu's ranks, and all of a sudden, he had an army of 20,000 men. Tiai Shi Tzu and Yan Bai Hu, however, both escaped Sun Tzu's clutches. All of this had happened in the space of six years, so Sun Tzu was still in his 20s and he already had all of these conquests and victories to add to his resume. Not bad at all. Then things got even better for him, as Yuan Shu foolishly declared himself emperor of a new Zhong dynasty, apparently bedazzled by that shiny piece of jade that he received from Sun Tzu. Now, why is this a good thing for the new up-and-coming warlord? The reason why was because everyone up to this point was fighting in the name of the Han Dynasty. Even Tao Tao, who had so kindly taken the Emperor into his custody for protection. So when someone had the gall to declare themselves Emperor, it was like a sheep inviting wolves to dinner. The other factions all turned on Yuan Shu and begun invading his land once again. Now one would think that Yuan Shu was Sun Tzu's lord, so surely he should help him, right? But no. Sun Jian, Sun Tzu's father, was a general of the Han. So how could he fight for a usurper and dishonour his father so like? Therefore, then, 
Sun Tzu broke away from Yuan Shu formally and had his own little kingdom. So like I said, Sun Tzu's fortunes were rising and Yuan Shu's were declining. And I think I speak for all here when I say it was deservedly so. All Yuan Shu had to do was give Sun Tzu that piece of land and he probably would have remained. But there we go. While Yuan Shu was being pummeled from the north by Tao Tao and Lu Bu, Sun Tzu also began encroaching on his former master's territory. But not so much. Instead, he drove his army south and did battle with Liu Yao's forces once again. On his journey, he bumped into Tiai Shi Tzu once again. But this time, he defeated and captured the general. As well as others. Now, if it was anyone else, the likely fate for Tiai Shi Tzu here would have been death. But instead, Sun Tzu showed him mercy. Wanting to pay his new commander back for his kindness, Tai Shi Tzu served Sun Tzu loyally and proved to be a very capable officer. In the year 199, Yuan Shu finally died and most of his army and followers flocked to Liu Xun. Now remember here that Liu Xun is the guy who took over that commandery that was promised to Sun Tzu. So naturally, Sun Tzu wanted revenge for this. But rather than just taking his army and invading, Sun Tzu resulted to a clever diplomacy. He pretended to befriend Liu Xun and suggested that he attack Tao Tao in the north, while Sun Tzu would bring up the rear. Liu Xun foolishly took this advice and marched north. Now Sun Tzu did bring up the rear as promised, but rather than helping Liu Xun, he basically took over his territory and his capital, the city of Huan. Stuck between a very hard place and an even harder place, Liu Xun retreated to Liu Biao's territory and went to Huang Zhu, the man who had killed Sun Jian, Sun Tzu's father. So now, Sun Tzu has seen a golden opportunity to deal with both of these old enemies, and he did so rather quickly, close to the city of Jiangxia. Claiming that he would have justice for his father's death and for the betrayal he had to suffer through, Sun Tzu led the charge into Jing province and annihilated the soldier stationed there. And Sun Tzu killed Huang Zhu in the fighting. Liu Xun, however, did manage to escape to the court of Tao Tao, but then he faded from the picture. From... In the year 200, Sun Tzu wanted to march southwest once again, as he heard that Liu Yao had died and that his faction was divided. Sending Tiai Shi Tzu to scout ahead, Sun Tzu hoped to easily annex the province left behind by Liu Yao, and when Tiai Shi Tzu came back, he confirmed that the province could be taken with ease. So Sun Tzu, once again, led his army southwest and annexed the city of Yujin, the capital of Liu Yao's territory. So in the space of nine years, Sun Tzu had lost his father, then been an obscure general, and now he was the most powerful warlord in southern China and one of the most powerful warlords within the empire. And thus he earned the nickname the Little Conqueror, a play on the speed of his campaigns and the fact that he was still extremely young. Even Tao Tao commented on Sun Tzu. He once said that will come, he will be difficult to deal with later. And of course, he doesn't deal with Sun Tzu personally, but he deals with Sun Quan, and yes, he was a problem for Tao Tao. But we'll get to him later on. So, as things were beginning to ascend for Sun Tzu, he had to deal with two rebels, Yan Bai Hu, once again, and another man named Xu Gong, who was the previous commander of the commandery of Wu. The two had joined forces and they rebelled in Wu commander. So bringing up his army, Sun Tzu crushed the rebel army once again. But this time, it was different. Being a naturally fast rider and skilled hunter, Sun Tzu always sped ahead of his fellow generals when the enemy scattered. But this time he went too far, and he was ambushed by three of Xu Gong's men. The three men shot arrows at Sun Tzu. All of them missed, but one of them hit Sun Tzu in the jaw. Despite the doctor's assurances that Sun Tzu would live, he died that night, as his jaw wounds broke open. On the 5th of May, 200 AD, Sun Tzu had died at the humble age of 25.
So this begs the question, who would take over his domain as he had a son? But his son was still an infant. So Sun Tzu apparently gave the empire he built for himself to his younger brother Sun Quan. Some people say that Sun Quan stole the position, whilst others said it was the will of Sun Tzu. Regardless, Sun Quan took over Dongwu in the year 200 at the age of 18. Now, despite being young, Sun Quan got the support of both senior officials and the military officers which were under the, the, his older brother's command. Sun Quan immediately made reforms to his state and to the army, appointing Sun Tzu's best friend, Zhou Yu, as the commander of the military forces for the entire state. By the time we get around to the year 208 at the Battle of Red Cliffs, which will be discussed in next week's podcast, Sun Quan had transformed the state of Wu into a prosperous land and then was in direct competition with Tao Tao, who had consolidated all of his holdings in the north. By the time the year 208 came around, it was simply a matter of when before, sorry, a matter of time and when before the forces of Wu and Wei collided at the Battle of Red Cliffs. It was the battle that made the Three Kingdoms the Three Kingdoms. So next week, what I will do is go away from the southeast and we will look into the establishment of Shu Han, or the struggles that Liu Bei goes through in his early career. And we may just go over this and then the Battle of Red Cliffs, and then, of course, what Liu Bei does after this battle. Just because, I mean, the battle was pr- primarily between uh, the forces of Sun Quan and the forces of Tao Tao, but it is Liu Bei who does get all of the rewards from that battle. So we will talk about that next week. Well, we're at the same time period. We're just going to go back and we're going to look at the life and the career of Liu Bei and his sworn brothers, Zhang Fei and Guan Yu. So, I hope you can stay around for next week and thank you very much again for listening to the Chronicle Podcast channel.